You know, when you can't see that money can't be eaten. It's where you are. So we welcome everyone. I'm still waiting a few more minutes, just about two or three, then we can get started. And as we're getting started, I want everybody to know we are the Racial Justice Collaborative. And we have some members here, uh, Jordana Hart, Frank Eason, Catherine Saunders, Mark Saunders, Farrell Saunders, and um, uh, Lily and Mina. So we are all here and more of us are coming. I'm giving us time to get in. Um, here comes Jai, Jai is a member also. <laughs> So we're all supporting each other in the work that we do. And again, that is the Let's Talk About Race song. Um, it was updated. This was the first draft of it, and it was updated because um, it now has Diane Wong and Farrell Saunders. We are the co-hosts for Let's Talk About Race. So, uh, so somehow I have the older version of this song, but uh, but Sundiata created the song for us and uh, we needed something of our own. So here it is. Let's talk about race. And that's the, that's what we're doing today. We've got two more minutes to wait and then we're going to start. What we're doing today and what we're going to do uh, throughout the summer and into the fall We've started an effort to, we've been talking about race, but we're, we're, we're pushing it up a notch. So we're calling it the summer and fall, 2001, the summer and fall of truth. Truth. So uh, as, as we all know who have gone through, if we're in the United States and have gone through the United States educational system, you don't, you don't see much. Um, you don't hear much or learn much about the American history that is African-American history. It's all American history. So we're bringing it more fully in so that everybody can really understand uh, the nature of the United States of America and uh, how we, what our beginnings were like, uh, how, how we've changed or not changed over the years when it comes to African-American history. Um, so, okay, Adam, can we start? And so if we can get started and here, the, the title of this event is, and so we can, we can cut the music in the background uh, and we're still recording, that's good. So the title of the event is um, lo looking at the, I, I've forgotten the exact title, but we're looking at the wealth gap. So here we wanted to put graphs up so you can get a better idea. So when you watch today and you listen, Farrell Saunders is going to do most of the program today. And, uh, and we're going to have a big chance to talk about the things that we're bringing up. We have a hour plus video that we've prepared. We're not gonna show the whole video today. We're gonna to use clips so we have time to talk, but you're gonna get the video. Uh, we're gonna send it out to you, the whole video. It's an hour plus uh, because uh, it's, it's about an hour and 15 minutes or so. But here you can see the graphs and you can see that the, 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 the median family wealth by race from 1963 to 2016. And you see here, starting in 1963, you can see that there's a wealth gap between black wealth on the bottom. Now this is an income, this is wealth, which is uh, basically all of everything, you have, all of your assets minus your debts. So you look at the black wealth at the bottom and the white wealth is well above that. And you can see that over the years, the black wealth is pretty much, it looks like it's about the same to me as it was in 1963, but that the white wealth has gone up in slight dips, it keeps going up, it's slight dips. So 
so just so you notice that, keep that in mind as we go through the uh, charts and the graphs today. And here at the bottom, maybe you can see my pointer. Here at the bottom uh, is, is another way of looking at that, the median net worth, this starts at 1989. So again, you see the, the median net worth of black people and black families here at the bottom. Um, and the interesting thing, if you go over to the third and last graph here again, now this is in family income. So you can see that family income of black families is here at the bottom. Interesting, in 1967, that was the first time that they separated uh, other peoples of color from African-Americans. So in these early charts, all people of color were uh, pressed into African-American statistics. So when you look now at starting about here, you see that um, Latinos started to have their own line uh, and they're slightly above the, the black uh, family income. And then you see the white family income in the blue purple line. And then above that, uh, the Asian uh, family income. So just to give you something to think about, this is where we here looked at the top one again, 10 times all the way from as far as this graph goes back, the, at least in 2016, the wealth of white um, families was 10 times that of black families and eight times that of Latino families. So uh, Adam next. Adam, thank you. I want everybody to meet Adam Stone. He's our uh, technology guru. And so here, this is important for everybody to think about. These are things to think about while we're doing this program today. We, American slavery can trace its beginnings back to 1526. And um, in 1526 to 1865 is the period of American slavery. So that's 339 years of formal legal slavery. And then from 1865 with the uh, ending of the Civil War and the amendments to the Constitution, we've got um, the from 1865, and so there, so African Americans during this time were, as people think about it, free-ish, free-ish, uh, because of black codes, which, which you'll hear a lot about. We had black codes that, that came in to criminalize petty behavior that was never criminalized before, uh, so that they could uh, put black people in jail and then ship them out, uh, rent them out, to do more free labor. That was the point of every, every, that was the whole point to keep black people in as close condition as, to slavery as possible without, be, without being uh, technically enslaved. So here you've got that. And then of course, Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, separate but equal, uh, really formalized segregation in this country. And uh, one other thing to watch while we're talking 1935 Social Security Act that um, was put in place to provide a safety net for unemployment and for what became Social Security. And it specifically exempted 60% uh, of African Americans the way it did that. It, it exempted farm workers, it exempted domestics. So even think about that today, the people who are doing domestic work, they're still not getting unemployment. So when you ask yourself, how can I be at home during this pandemic and other people are, are out there still working? Well, they have to be working if they wanna live. And then we've got 1954, the um, Brown versus Board of Education started to break up segregation. And we have another slide, Farrell will talk about uh, the Brown versus Board of Education and how that played out in Boston 20 years later, still opening up uh, segregation and we're still there. So here we've got 
these numbers of years of, um, I think it's still free-ish because discrimination, hearts and minds hold on to the be belief in uh, black inferiority. So here we are. So Adam. Hey, hey can I just interrupt? Few people asked if we could have the slides on full versus the, the browser mode, then it'll make them a little bigger. Um, I don't think so. I think we can't. Um, but but you're when you get the video, you're going. It's going to be in full uh, slide mode, and then you'll be able to see everything. So, uh, Adam, that's enough for now. The next slide was just going to bring up the people that we want to be sure to acknowledge, and and those are the people. Uh, some of the grantors out and around here. So we've got the Massachusetts Cultural Council that uh, has provided some funding to make this all possible. And so then we've got Natick, Wayland, uh, Somerville, Newton, and, um, and Wellesley all contributed to making this effort, this whole effort, this whole summer long program possible. So, I want everybody to know uh, that we're recording this. And so if you don't want to be recorded, just um, eliminate your video. You're mostly not going to be seen uh, because uh, most of the time we're going to see uh, we're going to see Farrell. But everybody and hi, Sarah. So we want you to know that we're recording and uh, we're going to look at this again after. If you don't want to be in the recording, just cut off your video. Hope you can stay on though. So, um, so before we get started, I feel my heart already racing because I'm speeding ahead, trying to get it all into an hour and a half. So let's everybody take a deep breath in and then exhale and take another deep breath in. And exhale, I'm a yoga teacher, so it's important to do this breathing. Another last breath in. And exhale, slow, long exhalation. And then just bring your awareness inside of your body and scan around inside of your body. If you find any place where you feel tension or stress, just breathe into that spot. Just hold your awareness on that spot and inhale and release. Ah. If you open your mouth and audibly exhale, you release tension and stress from inside the body. And so paying attention to stress as it first comes up uh, your stress is living just like you are. And so it wants attention. If you give it some attention, inhale into it, take, let that life force in the breath go into it. And the body can sort out what it wants to do with the healing breath. And that's all you need to do. So you don't maintain a stressful situation in your life going forward. So thank you all very much for coming. I'm going to move right into uh, bringing uh, Farrell Saunders. And he's going to do most of our program today. As I said to everybody, we're going to show a clip of a video, the video you will receive the whole thing of uh, sometime soon after the event. And um, so, Let's look at these clips. We're going to stop and start to talk. So I'm going to want to call on people. If you So let's start to get ready for our conversation. We're going to talk about race. And so Adam, can you put up the first clip? So how did we get here? That's the main question we're trying to ask. We're trying to ask how the Black community got to where we are in our current place in history, and especially when viewing this through the lens 
of white supremacy and how that's impacted things like social justice and especially the modern and historical incarnations of the wealth gap. So when we're talking about this, we want to address first and foremost the uh, original sins of America, so to speak. So we're here to talk about the theft of land and especially the theft of people and how we're going to be honing in over the course of this presentation. How specifically these acts were not just acts that were perpetrated, but how they are protected by law and the after effects of these things were protected by law long after they were either denounced or made uh, illegal in the original acts themselves and how they were justified by practice even when laws no longer applied, how they were continued to be maintained through social pressure and various other actions like that. So to begin, we're going to talk a bit about the origins of slavery and the history of how that was first brought to the United States. Because it's obviously no secret how important slavery was to the foundation and the early history of the United States. However, the very specifics of how it started is actually something that may not be known by a great number of people. So the slavery practice in the United States was chattel slavery. That was a direct tie-in to the overall triangle trade, which was a European system of transatlantic slavery that had existed prior to the United States and various Caribbean and South American colonies, where you had uh, slave labor, which were uh, purchased or captured in Africa, that were then brought over to colonies in the United States and also South America and the Caribbean especially. First and foremost, those two in the United States would later follow suit. And then those uh, raw goods would be harvested in the United States, whether that's cotton or sugar cane or things like that. Then those raw goods would be sent from the colonies to Europe where it would be manufactured into uh, completed goods. And then those completed goods would be sold across the world, traded, especially in the context of the triangle trade, things like weapons or, you know, uh, manufactured clothing sold in Africa in order to purchase more slaves in order to keep the triangle trade uh, going. And that's what completes the circuit of it. But specifically in the context of how this relates to the United States, we had a specific incident in 1619 where a Portuguese vessel was... Uh, running low on supplies and uh, was uh, required to uh, you know, touch down and make port in Virginia. In order to get supplies and to uh, pay for repairs to the vessel, the Portuguese sailors, the only collateral that they had on their vessel were African slaves. So this is before African slaves had been uh, imported to the United States. And it started this trend. This is the first inciting incident. Because uh, before this, there wasn't uh, any history or context to that in the uh, 13 original colonies. But that changed. So these 350 African slaves were sold by their Portuguese slavers to the new Virginian Americans. And originally, there were laws and standards about how this would be treated, about you know their rights to have... Uh, for the men uh, to have wives and if their children would be slaves. And at first, there was a much more um, significantly less chattel-esque uh, lens on this, where the, or the children of these slaves were not going to originally be enslaved. But very quickly in, only some uh, less than a generation, decades in, that was seen to be no longer feasible and strict laws separating uh, these new uh, black people that were imported to the Americas and white people were established. And that was much more in line with how future incarnations of African slavery would go in the United States. I believe it's muted. Okay, so see, that's what happens. 
I muted myself so I could drink this water. And then my picture, <laughs> my picture wasn't up here, so I couldn't unmute. So here we are. Everybody unmute. We're going to talk. Uh, let me ask Farrell now to, um, Farrell, can you kind of, as, as we just want to start the conversation. So, sure. for for two ahead. things, for two immediate addendums, I for one, I see a question that was put uh, by uh, Jordana Hart in the uh, in the chat regarding the former timeline. And yes, that's true. That wasn't uh, date specifically in the context of the United States. It was more uh, of a global context than that, specifically as to the uh, the fifteen hundreds date that was provided in the previous slides. And another thing is in regards to the, uh, the Portuguese slaver vessel. So that is definitely, you know, intrinsically tied to the history of slavery in the continental United States. But in actuality, what happened was that very same vessel was actually raided by English privateers sailing under the flag of uh, the Netherlands. And it was those pirates that stole those slaves from that Portuguese ship and then touched down and made port in Virginia, selling them to the American Virginians. So just in terms of complete accuracy, historically, that is specifically what happens. But the rest remains to be true. Nancy. So I've always read that in 1619, it was a Dutch man of war and that there were 19 people from Africa. Exactly. So is that is that was that the next, uh, after the original pirate ship, was that English or that was Portuguese? Well, they were English pirates, but they were sailing under the flag of Netherlands as the uh, of the Netherlands as privateers. So it was a Dutch ship, but it was being sailed by an English crew of pirates. And it, and by that time, there were only nineteen people accounted for. Or do you think there were more, Cheryl? No, there was a roughly uh, nineteen to early, like um, like high teens to early twenties uh, in terms yeah, of they... the count. So that could do with. The number of slaves there the pirates were able to steal from the portuguese ship or injuries incurred in the battle during the pirates attacked the portuguese ship so it could be any number of those things as to why there were significantly less but there were a number of african slaves stolen by these uh by these uh, english pirates and a, and a dutch vessel yeah okay i understand mm -hmm. yeah so the 350 um the the ship did leave west africa Yes. Uh, the coast of West Africa with 350. Uh, that was the Portuguese ship, but it was waylaid. There was a lot of theft. <laughs> There's a lot of theft a lot going of theft on uh, all around. All around. So um, let me, you know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer by training. So that means I look out and see who do I want to call on. <laughs> um, I want to give an opportunity for us to really start to talk about race. So can somebody um, that can can somebody just say out of that kind of beginning information, uh, do you have any questions uh, for Farrell or any thought about how go back into those feelings that you have on the inside and start to express some of that. Daniel, you're laughing. Um, what's going on with you? Nothing. I was just, I didn't realize my mic was on. I, was, I'm, I'm always, I just love to hear you speak. So I'm just laughing and listening to you speak and just thinking. So no comment. Okay. Um, Daniel, your laughter is so welcome because the subject matter is so intense. And I just want to thank you, Farrell, for presenting it in such a wonderful, clear way and uh, for being willing to do that and being such a great uh, presenter of that information. So I just want to say hi to everyone and I'm glad to be here and um, I feel um, I, it's such a mix of emotions I can't even really name it. So when I saw you laugh it was like oh my goodness that's welcomed and it's I almost feel like crying so anyway. It is a, a grim history, but yeah. it's an important one. And I agree. I think the Socratic method, you know, functions well here, the gadfly approach. <laughs> well, just just to talk about, you know, the ramifications, you look at this early beginning, and then you see how the legal system in the courts of Virginia right away 
started saying, oh, well, now any child of someone from Africa is going to be considered property and just have a legal system put a legal noose around everyone's head and neck. And I think uh, we have to see the complicity of the legal system right from the very beginning in this constant constriction and legal making it. So when I would say white people say the law of the land, where does that law come from? It comes from the beginnings where it was okay to legally enslave and continue to oppress and kill black people legally. I mean, it was in the law. You can just shoot a black person on sight. So, because they're considered property. So see, we have the, the, the law of the land is uh, got racist beginnings. Certainly, you know, when people speak to the value and the importance and sanctity uh, often in regards to the law in terms of, you know, culture and society, it's often spoke of in a way that makes it seem as though it is, yeah, since it's above singular people, also not prone to the mistakes of people, but obviously every law is man-made. Everything has to have an origin in terms of a human decision and human motivation. And in the context of this history, when uh, the original African slaves were brought to the, or were sold in the Virginia colony by these pirates, you know, it was originally done in the context of uh, like indentured servitude, because that was the context that existed and was frequently used in the 13 colonies that would be most similar to this. So it was sort of like the adjacent law, but it was very quickly changed as to fit this new context and more mirrored and reflected the uh, aspects of slavery that were being used in the Caribbean colonies, most specifically. But also when people compare slavery in Africa or Greece, they're not understanding that in the colonies of the United States, chattel slavery with cruel attendance to it was designed and created through the legal system which is not the same as trading people through uh, tribal battles and saying, okay, you take a few of my people for a while and I'll take, you know, whoever the victor was. It's a completely, it's like, you know, yes, an orange yes. and an apple. People are yes. comparing completely different types of systems of trade. Uh, this was not trade. This was buying, selling, oppressing, and killing people. It's definitely a brutal trade and more so. I completely agree with the statement they just made and I could make an entire presentation about that because it is staggering how frequently people make that false equivalency and how frequently I've uh, talked to people about how false that equivalency is in regards of comparing things like you know and slavery and antiquity or even in the same time frame you know like you were mentioning you know native african slavery or even arab slave trade etc because obviously it is still uh, uh, the purchasing of people or the capture of people and forcing of work. But there are so many aspects to the triangle trade system of slavery that are more specific and more, you know, long-term intergenerationally damaging than simply the fact that you have people working and doing labor for free. That's the surface of it. It's about how you strip those people of language, how you strip those people of history or culture or literacy and right. all of those things are the layers of it that make this particular history of slavery so cruel and different from other forms of history and other forms of slavery that have existed in history. So Farrell, oh. one of the things, um, obviously people bring up that comparison because they want to diminish the savagery of the slavery that went on here and it makes them feel better to say that. But Diane, you started by asking how we feel and what I want to do, and you know I feel this way, is I don't want people to even feel emotion because we know emotion and ethics and what's right is not going to move American society anywhere because it hasn't. And so the importance of this presentation and the other things we're going to do is that it's, it's about heart. It's like follow the money. And if the whole country, if we, if with facts, we show that the country, the base of its absolute huge wealth now was stolen land and stolen people, which it was, then we don't need to have people sitting back feeling sad because no one, that doesn't get us anywhere, at least not in the US. And so that's why the work, you know, that the collaborative doing and what Farrell's doing is important because in the end, 
when you go to primary sources and you see the cold hard facts, which will eventually lead up to reparations, I don't care. Money is what counts in the US apparently, whether we like it or not, and if we show that. And then one other quick point is when we think of the businesses, the people here, the businesses we own, the people we employ, what are our largest costs? Our largest costs are paying salaries and paying leases or buying a, a place for our business. So think about if we didn't have to pay any of that. And that's really when you look back in history, how the wealth grew so hugely and then tied into the Northeast with the banking, with the insurance, transportation, you know, rails, etc. So I just want to say that feeling bad is fine, but it really in the end isn't going to get us anywhere. I completely agree. Like I prefaced this off with this is a grim history, but honestly, when you view it objectively, most of human history is grim. This is a human history that has particular importance in my life and, how, and my thinking, but even ones that aren't, most of it is grim. And it's important to value it because of the lessons that it teaches and how you move on from it and right. understanding origins of it rather than just, you know, sort of raw emotional response. Because I do agree that that isn't necessarily going to do anything about correcting uh, trajectories or anything like that. A and it's I capitalism. And so we have to look at that as well. It's all linked together. Sorry, go ahead. I, well, I wanted to, to ask Farrell um, that one of the things I felt that was really particularly powerful uh, was the graphic that was shown with the timeline, right? And so as a visual learner, I think it's important to look at that timeline um, in terms of the period of legalized slavery right? Um, and then the preceding periods that happened, which were kind of slavery-ish um, and free-ish, as Diane um, pointed to, um, in all of those periods of time, even from a financial standpoint, let alone emotional, right? Just the financial element of it. If you could talk about the amount of wealth that's generated from free labor uh, in this trading in this period of time during a formative part of the development of the United States, Right, like so, how significant is it that that period of time? You look at that that timeline. Um, you had legalized slavery, and then you had other um, kinds of laws that continued to benefit, um, you know, whites as opposed to other people in this country. So that's of massive importance, and I definitely agree that that visual aspect can be a very useful tool for helping people understand the magnitude of things. And it reminds me very much of if you look at what a physical picture of a million dollars looks like versus the physical picture of what a billion dollars looks like. Because the words are similar and words are just letters. It's easier for people to understand the visuals that those things are attached to. And it's a staggering difference if it isn't something that you've looked at. And I recommend that you do. But in regards to uh, the amount of wealth generated from the, the slave trade, it's massive. It's incalculable. The, the American colonies wouldn't exist without slavery because slavery is a financial you know system that was the point it was well that's not true the triangle trade and the chattel slavery that was used for it was for financial system and that is it in its entirety if it wasn't profitable it wouldn't have been done and the and that can be uh true about a lot of things including colonization if it wasn't profitable it wouldn't have been done and it wasn't for a long time, which is why it took so long to start American colonies for the European powers. Because originally, you know, the first European powers to actually begin to make colonies in the Americas were, you know, obviously the Spanish and Portuguese empires, the Iberian empires. And their original forms of uh, gain of wealth was just pure plunder rather than the use of land for cultivation of, you know, resources. It was just you know, the conquest of native civilizations and taking their wealth from them, their silver, their gold, etc. And then sometime after, there was the idea of using uh, the land to actually cultivate wealth. And that was done through a form of slavery of Native Americans, uh, the Encomiata system. And it was used by the Spanish primarily, and it lasted for a while. And it was a good foundation for what uh, future forms of slavery would look like, especially in the Iberian uh, colonies. But it didn't last for primarily two reasons, which is one, there was a lot of loss of life in Native American civilizations due to uh, transfer of disease in the Columbus Exchange. And also it was 
relatively uh, commonplace for native sla uh, for native slaves to be able to escape because of uh, greater understanding and familiarity with the land. And so eventually the use of a, another form of labor was necessary and it was really hard to get, you know, uh, European peasants to want to pack up their lives and move to these colonies that weren't developed and had very little opportunity for having any kind of life. So there was some degree of like, if you were incredibly impoverished and you, you just had to sell your life into servitude, which is what indentured servitude is, but that wasn't nearly enough to cover the cost of human labor necessary to make colonies right. profitable. So and, then and, and, the next course of action was another form of manpower that was uh, required to make these colonies profitable, which came from Africa. And it came from both the purchasing of slaves from African civilizations, as well as just the capturing of Africans in conflicts of war, like specifically uh, relating to the slide that uh, and the video that was just shown. That well, was I, wanted, I wanted to make a quick and, comment. And, but Nancy, can you hold off? Because we've got six more clips. And and some of this information is going to appear in those. Yeah, some of it is some of it is related. But just to finish my point, what I was saying was that the Portuguese vessel in question and the last video was uh, returning from West Africa with uh, slaves that were taken from just raiding the coast from uh, the uh, uh, Central African Kingdom. It was the Kingdom of Ndongo that was being raided by uh, Portugal at the time. So that is the human labor that was used in order to you know, yes. make this land profitable. I see I we don't have any problem getting all of us to have a discussion about race. And that's wonderful. Nancy, finish this up and then we'll go to the next slide. I just wanted to say one question about process. Um, uh, I may have a different take on it than, well, what Jordana said, feelings are not going to make people uh, change systems of racism. The point of touching into our feelings right now is so we can absorb the information that's a process we're going through to help us bear our feelings about this violent, traumatizing history. It's yes. not because Nancy, that's gonna that's, motivate that's, everybody. That's, that was all I'm trying to do. I to, I'm happy that Jordana said, this isn't gonna motivate people. I'm just talking about the people here today to keep yourself grounded so you can keep absorbing, as Nancy said, information. So Adam, can we go on to the next slide? See what's coming up. Here we have images that capture some of the aspects of slavery in the South. And it's truly for me, especially highlights two things, which is one, it helps to remind how old the technology of the photograph is. And it also helps to remind how recent slavery is, that it was able to be captured so literally captured so directly, not a sketch, not a portrait capturing these things, but a flash of a camera and the imprint of a moment captured in time. An important aspect to note when we talk about the history of American slavery, of course, is the multiple revolts and uh, insurrections that were thrown in order to have African slaves overthrow their impressors or try to seek freedom or establish individual states. Much as there are stories of slave revolts throughout all aspects of the triangle trade, whether that be slave revolts in the Caribbean, which are famously successful, such as the Haitian Revolution, or many such revolts in colonies such as Brazil, in addition to also the United States. So an important thing to note is generally how these revolts started, whether that be an African slave that had a history or background of being educated or literate that was able to spread information and able to organize their fellows in order to plan such things, especially in cases where these individuals had a military background, such as in the 1811 German Coast Uprising, where the founders of said uprising were actually military officers from the Kingdom of Congo in Central Africa, which were able to organize the slaves even without a common language because slaves were brought from all over the continent, all across West Africa and various kingdoms, Central Africa, dipping down into the Southern parts 
And so they were able to be organized by certain individuals that had enough charisma, strength of leadership, and also skill set. Okay, so um, we have really good clips ahead, so we want to get them in. So we're going to just uh, do about five minutes. Uh, Farrell, can you start us off? So to start off on this section, I thought it was really important to include because something that I believe is important for my education on this subject, as well as something I try to highlight when I trying to talk to others about this subject is to highlight that the entirety of this stretch of time isn't a, a complete history of passivity, because I believe that's a really negative and reductionist view of this stretch of history. It is a disservice to people that actively uh, led moral uh, fights uh, to you. free themselves and to, you know, try to oh. establish things that were outside of the parameters that are generally taught. Because generally when you receive educations about things like this, you, you very rarely learn a great deal about the perspectives of uh, losing sides in conflicts. And that has nothing to do with what is necessarily moral or even historically fascinating or interesting. So I thought it was important to highlight those things. And obviously I only touched on some of them in order to keep the time frame uh, reasonable, but there's a lot of information written there if you'd want to do further research about any of those other historical incidents because they are all fascinating. If I could piggyback off of that, how is everybody doing peace? And uh, I'm, I'm really sitting back enjoying, uh, well, I'll say absorbing what's being said. I really thought that what Farrell was just was talking about is important for uh, everybody to look at because I hear certain comments from peoples, different people who look at the situation of Moorish Americans and so-called African Americans here and say, you know, well, when it happened here or there, you know, we fought back. We had the Maroons that were in, you know, Jamaica. We had this and that. We fought back and y'all just took it. And I'm like, wait a minute not quite. And really, you start talking to me long enough, I got a totally different paradigm on it anyway, but just going along with what you're saying, yes, there were rebellions and people have been fighting to stay alive all along. Our struggle is testament to the fact that Diane is sitting there with kids who's still here. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whether we scrapping or just trying to make it, it's been a struggle all along. You know, so... Yeah, that I thought that was an important part. I just wanted to add on to that. And so I wanted to add also that, and Farrell, you know this, that in the schools they're teaching, at the very least, teaching slavery in a very neutral way and focusing on the docility of Black people um, and trying to make it appear as if it's really not quite as bad. It even go, it goes back to the comparison we talked about before of trying to diminish the savagery of US slavery. And the other thing it brings up to me as a white person is, and I'm always even curious now of that one singular white person who rises up as a true ally, uh, and that's John Brown. I've read his biography. He's a really interesting character and you put him in his, in his historical context and it's like, you know, what made that guy the way he is, you know, it's just a, a slew of just white people who really, excuse my language, didn't give a shit. Uh, at the very least, as opposed to actually, you know, actually working to keep slavery in place. And I'm always curious, I look through all the ages, I look through photos, even from the 60s, to see those individual white people who are with Black people marching, and I wonder who they are. And I wonder, you, you know what I'm saying? Now, it, that's just from my perspective. But anyway, that's what it reminded me of. I think that John Brown is fascinating historically, especially with the the reason, like the the statement they just made about uh, there were so many people that viewed what was happening, also thought that it was wrong, but didn't do anything about it necessarily. Certainly not anything physical like he did. There's also things that you can do to try to impact something, but he didn't just uh, you know try to raise legislation or protest. He actively did something, you know, violent. And at the time it was something that was viewed, you know, as 
what it was legally, which was a crime, but even yeah. how that was viewed would change not even that long after it happened. You know, like songs regarding uh, John Brown and uh, the, the, the rebellion that he had tried to start would be used for like union marching songs in the Civil War, like very shortly after it happened. So it was very interesting to see how he was regarded and thought of even in the context of American history right during, you know, his lived in era. But uh, yeah, that's definitely uh, an important thing to, to note in regards to the history of uh, revolts that were done in the context of the United States against slavery in the United States. No, so um, let me call on Daniel. I see Daniel trying to get into the discussion. You see, I'm watching Daniel. He's got a nice smile here. So Daniel, come and say what you have to say. Hello. Um, so I guess I had a few comments. I want to say uh, one fair, I also love hearing you speak. Uh, <laughs> but so I'm listening to, as you speak about like these different revolts and things of that nature. And I know recently, or within like the past two years for me, something that really stuck out is how like none of this history is linear and everything is kind of a reaction to another thing. So I was reading about, so Haiti emancipates itself in 1804. So they become the first free um, black nation. But then we see how that information travels to enslaved black people in Cuba. And then I believe in 1814, we have a Ponte's rebellion and he's walking around with like a book of drawings that are because he can't read, um, he's an enslaved person, but these drawings are about the Haitian revolution. Um, but then, so Aponte's revolution doesn't end well, but then people in the Americas hear about Aponte and then we know people in the South are now um, inspired by this and then that happens. So I think it's an interesting history and in how these things kind of dip and dive into each other. And to react to Sundieta, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, um, but uh, yeah, I think you're right in the fact that um, revolting and a rebellion isn't necessarily always have to be like a physical thing. I think that idea of existing is a form of rebelling and just making it to the next day um, when your days are really numbered and you don't know what's going to happen. So that was my reaction. And I wanted to respond to Nancy. I don't think Jordana meant that like we shouldn't feel emotions. I personally felt like sometimes of course you should feel, and, but I think we shouldn't get so caught up on the feel. I think we should feel and then act. So I think oftentimes people get caught up in the feeling of like maybe guilt sometimes and then get stuck in the idea of guilt and I'm sad and just nothing happens and then it becomes counterproductive. So I think that's for sure. I agree. Yeah, I hear you. I, I definitely agree uh, to respond to those things in reverse order. I definitely agree with that, uh, that final assessment that you made. I definitely have observed it happen enough times where you, you know, it, it depends. Different people have different emotional responses to different things. And some people can certainly take their emotional responses and allow themselves to use it to uh, continue to take in further information and become, you know, uh, empathically attached in a way that continues to drive them forward. I've seen other people do the exact opposite where you can also sometimes be overwhelmed by certain emotional responses. So it certainly depends on the individual and it's important to you know, recognize both of those potentialities. The middle thing was about uh, the form of like existence or perseverance as a form of revolt. And that I definitely agree with, but just and for me personally, because I'm you know, a very history-minded person. I've always just loved reading those things, studying those things. I definitely see that as an important moral victory and an important moral battle, but I also like reading about the real battles because those are important, and to act like all of our battles are the not real ones and the metaphysical ones or the metaphorical ones, I've never been a fan of that. Yeah, they're important, but it's not, not at the detriment of not learning about the real ones. And then the third thing which is about the Haitian Revolution, I completely agree that it's important to recognize how those things directly tie into each other. The 1811 German Coast Uprising was, you know, shortly after the Haitian Revolution, like you said, you said 1804, and it was actually directly inspired by it. The, uh, the Congolese uh, uh, officers that I had mentioned were directly inspired. They were actually literate, and they had heard news of the Haitian Revolution, and they were actively planning to have their, their uprising isolate uh, the uh, district of New Orleans, in order to try to establish an independent republic based on the New Orleans Delta. Yes, uh, Louisiana wasn't a state yet at the time, so it had much less direct uh, you know, stationing of American soldiers and things like that. 
And so that was the uh, the idea and the strategy behind that and how it directly played into the Haitian Revolution's you know, uh, growing fame. And in that sense, uh, it was also very important for how Louisiana became a state because that was the justification used by the territory governor to be like, oh, we need to be a state. Now we see what happened. So that's an important part to th uh, view how all these things are American history. It's not like a separate thing. This is this is all directly tied together. It's not a, a subsection of the subject. Well, thank you. Let's move right on to the next one. We're gonna have exciting things ahead. So Adam. So an important aspect that comes into both things that happened during the Civil War, but especially continuing after the Civil War, is the effect that this would have on freed Black people. So freed Black people during the Civil War, because of acts such as the Emancipation Proclamation, were often freed to very little. Many freed Black people would uh, join Union armies as they continued south in order to uh, finish their uh, total war against the Confederacy. But even in acts such as that, that offered very little protection from things such as disease and poor quality of living, because oftentimes these were, you know, even marches done without, uh, you know, standard qualities and boots or clothing and things like that. And without having such things like clothing, shelter, medical care. These were issues that would spread rapidly throughout these recently freed Black communities. And this is something that would continue even after the end of the Civil War. Here we have some quotes and some imagery in regards to this, how often it was believed that this was a uh, natural reaction you know, that these freed Black people were being left to die, you know, left at the mercy of exposure. And uh, released into a society as legally free, but without any protections that one would associate with uh, standard quality of citizenry for any, you know, developed nation of the time. Here we have a specific quote in regards to this, about this belief, about this held opinion that uh, Black people, once freed, certainly this is about getting rid of the institution of slavery, but even without the institution of slavery, it would still allow the Black issue to uh, solve itself, the idea that Black people would vanish. And like his brother, the Indian of the forest, you, he must melt away and disappear forever from the midst of us. And so we have it. I, I'm always struck. I, I learned a lot in, uh, in working with Farrell and preparing this information. I never realized uh, there were 4 million approximately um, uh, Africans, now African Americans, formerly enslaved people who were freed. But what exactly does that mean, <laughs> freed? You're in the midst of a hostile group of people who have fought to keep you enslaved, and now you're free and they're all around you. You have no clothes, you have no food, no shelter. And so a million or more of the uh, freed ex-slaves died during that short period after the, after the war into Reconstruction. Farrell, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, so in addition to that, of being you know, freed and released into a hostile environment full of hostile you know, individuals, you're also freed largely into you know, a, a destroyed environment a lot of the infrastructure of the South had been destroyed during the Civil War. So even, you know, even not factoring in, obviously it's an important factor, but if you were to separate for the sake of uh, thought exercise, the aspect of being surrounded by so many uh, hostile, you know, citizens in that context, you also 
have you know very little in the way of shelter that exists let alone shelter you'll be able to easily access because of prejudice so there's a lot to do in regards to uh you know the threat and the danger of exposure and just death from uh from lack of uh you know shelter I'm not sure if people actually see the chat, but there are some things that, you know, several folks have brought up that um, I, I just wanted to make a mention. Um, Jordana mentioned Lincoln and Marcus Garvey, among others, talked about freed enslaved people immigrating to the continent. So if people remember that um, conversation um, and, and clearly they had two different reasons for it. And then um, a question how does Peter 2.18 in religion, in addition to legal means then and now, play into racism and white supremacy? So first we need to know what Peter 2.18 is, then yeah. maybe we can answer yeah, that I question. So for anyone who may know, maybe fill us all in and then we, we can maybe answer it. <laughs> or Mark Saunders, would you like to add that? <laughs> okay, so I, so okay. I, so uh, in regards, that, I think that that is definitely an interesting thing, both in regards to the historical context that we're going to be talking about, and also theology, which is another field that I find interesting. So to read the verse, Peter 2.18, slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also those who are harsh. So that's an important sort of thing to consider when you think about the massively long lens of relevance and context in Abrahamic religion, which is the sort of uh, the certain levels of uh, acceptance that go into believing in a uh, omnipotent being. So, I don't want to turn this into a, a theological conversation, or not at least not an overly one, because it's certainly one I can do, but it's not really the intention of this of this uh, event. But it has to do the 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 idea that I'm getting at is it largely has to do with the accepting of harsh of harshness and severity as not being uh, in, inherently negative things, and are often viewed as necessary things in the abrahamic context as there's you know harsh harsh treatment from god harsh punishments from god etc those things aren't viewed as evil those things are viewed as necessary because god is incapable of evil god is perfect in that context but anyway the point is that's obviously a quote that's drawn out because historically is one that was massively used for justification of slavery and justification of of uh, cruelty inflicted on on slaves by their masters you know it's very clear how that would be used to justify those actions and the greatest quote to ever exist about uh specifically religious texts is that you can use them to justify anything if you can find something to justify anything and that is certainly one that you can easily draw connections to for how that would historically be so used as to you know uh, sort of uh, draw submission from from uh, certain groups, and the other thing was about the uh, the um, returning of uh, Marcus Garvey, yeah, to uh, to the continent. You know, that's where the country of Liberia comes from historically. Is that it was very much that it wasn't something that was uh, it, it was much more viewed in a uh, complete and total sense you know, when it was proposed by both Lincoln and Garvey. And again, like you had mentioned, that it's for different reasons, you know, like the reason that Lincoln proposed that in the first place was because of the belief that uh, black and white people would be literally incapable of coexisting within the same nation as, uh, as equal free citizens. But he also did not believe in slavery. So, you know, that was the, the solution. And, um, yeah, it's definitely an, an interesting you know, concept, but a very unrealistic one, 
I, I believe personally, because it would require two things, which would one, it would require existing African nations to accept and also have the administrative and financial capacity to be able to admit, you know, massive numbers of new people being admitted in most uh, African nations on the continent at the time, or, you know, still, you know, the monarchies and or theocracies and things like that, that weren't equipped to just take this massive influx of people that didn't have, uh, well, in, in many contexts, didn't have direct ties, because these are people that had been multi-generationally like uh, in the United States at this point. They didn't have the, the ties to their nations of origin anymore in a way that would allow for easy repatriation or anything. Or it would require something that was similar to what sort of happened with the nation of Liberia, where an independent nation would be founded and made with the express purpose of accepting these people. And not only would that have to happen in the bare bones, which is what did actually happen, but also in order to be successful and have that many people come to it, it would require a large amount of funding from external sources, which in this context would obviously have to be the United States, which was never going to pass through Congress. So those are really the things that would have had to happen for that to be a realistic solution. And whether or not you think that's a realistic solution, you can still make an argument for whether or not you think it's the right solution. But even outside of that, it still requires a lot in order to even be possible, let alone the right choice. So um, he, at this point, we can move on. We have about four more clips to maybe get to. Get to. Uh, loss of loss of land. Okay, so Antoine, Ant, can Hines, can you speak up about? Uh, it's you, Antoine. Antoine. Okay, you also spoke about um, or put in the chat about a post traumatic uh, syndrome. So, could you talk about those two things? Yeah, just to a point of um, as we're talking about, basically almost to the point of accepting slavery and going on mentally um and believing that it was good to us to believe in the master it went on for 400 years and even to today we still have that same um uh, mentality in different um walks of life of um being oppressed mentally and different things and, and that's what i'm saying it, it starts from there as well as going into when we talk about wealth gap the land and everything disparities so just the whole point of 1865, you know, Civil War, you know, I'm listening to you all, if this is the point where all call her coalesced to be. What do you mean by coalesced? Pharaoh. So 1865, when the whole point of um, uh, the Confederate States, and I guess it was the army was, was, was protecting them at first, and then when the president switched and they pulled the army away oh, and then the over. land got so Yeah, isn't that during this period right here? It is. It's very close. Actually, yeah, I was just wondering the main topic of one of the next slides, but you're right. That is okay. right after this time period. And it's Okay, I'm just jumping again. Go on, Dan. <laughs> well, it's it that's good. And and just one quick thing I wanna bring up. I think I was supposed to bring it up before, but let me bring it up now. White supremacy. So white supremacy, people are starting to understand and talk about it more, but in the past, over the last couple of years, people have thought about white supremacy. They think about the Ku Klux Klan. They think about white supremacist organizations, but white supremacy was the, was the intention of, the, of this country. It was the intention from the very beginning. Everything you ever see in Dred Scott in 1857, that Supreme Court's case said that the white man has, the black man has no rights, no rights, zero, that the white man need respect. And so everything flows out of that. And so now we've got all of these systems. We've got education and healthcare and economics and, and housing, and we've got all of this stuff all of it white supremacy. It's all built to benefit. And if we get to it, we're gonna talk about the GI Bill and the redlining. And it was, in everything was always intended, healthcare, everything was intended to benefit white people at the detriment 
of black people. It's an anti-black idea. And it was so instilled in us through caricatures and through Jim Crow that, that we kind of all buy into it, that white is right. And so it's, and it's in our hearts and minds. And that's why we, we never let it go. It's never, we've never had an interruption in white supremacy as the norm. We're living in a white supremacist system. It's the norm. We all adjust to it. So let's go on to the next clip, Adam. In addition to these aspects of uh, entrapment and placing uh, Black people in positions where they're unable to freely uh, travel about uh, sufficiently or easily as a free citizen should be, you also have significant aspects of criminalization of uh, petty crimes or extremely small scale crimes, which allows for law enforcement to be extremely heavy handed and strict in regards to how black people were treated. Something that very much continues into the modern narrative about uh, criminalization of mundane acts by African American people and black people. So the Reconstruction Act of 1867 were a series of acts and laws that were passed in order to soften the harshness of the Black Codes exactly. So when generally when people talk about the eras of post-slavery after the Civil War and how that bled into racist laws, there is a significant blending in the minds of most people in regards to the Black Codes and the Jim Crow laws as a, you know, nebulous uh, singular stretch of time. When there is actually a particular uh, legal and historical difference in terms of both their function and their implementation. So with the Reconstruction Act of 1867 is when you get into this particular shift where you move away from the previous Black Codes and into the Jim Crow laws. For the Jim Crow laws had a specific focus on separating Black and white people after the court case of Plessy versus Ferguson, specifically in regards to the strengthening of the foundations of the term separate but equal, rather than the Black Codes previously, which were specifically and much more blatantly uh, targeting the even most basic rights and freedoms of technically freed Black people. So the Jim Crow laws, such as I had recently described, were very much about the segregation of Black and white people, allowing them to not be in close proximity or occupy the same public spaces. This included as simple a thing as uh, being able to associate in certain spaces outside using things such as the same bathrooms and water fountains. And this is something that a lot of people have a clear image in their mind of when they think of uh, American uh, uh, segregation and the uh, civil rights era is this form of law and this form of incredibly pervasive and uh, entrenched system of laws that were across every level of being a private citizen and stretching well into aspects of government service, such as the military. During this era is when you also get a specific boom in a lot of the uh, particular physical caricatures that continue to be used to demonize Black people is where you have uh, a lot of the births of specific stereotypes which can, uh, still continue these days, such as blackface is a very commonly known one. So just because I don't want the, the moment to be lost because it was, re it was brought up during the last video, I think we might have like uh, gone over the uh, the uh, reconstruction slide because it definitely was one made but because it because it was asked about so you know during the uh the reconstruction era like like you had mentioned it was something that was done you know immediately post-civil war or 
after the completion of the war, because that's an important thing to remember is that there were the Emancipation Proclamation was done before the war actually ended. And so there were lots of freed black people that had no forms of uh, governmental assistance or aid and were just uh, prone to massive issues with overexposure, rampant disease, no shelter, et cetera, et cetera. So when the war actually ended and the reconstruction process began, there was a government agency created called the Freedmen's Board, which was responsible for a lot of things, but the most important one in the context of this conversation was it was responsible for uh, aiding in the transition for uh, freed, uh, formerly enslaved people and refugees from the Civil War, because obviously there was lots of destruction of property, homes, entire cities. So there are lots of refugees, both white and black, after the Civil War. So the Freedmen Board was primarily responsible for aiding those people in that transition. It was one that very quickly lost funding because of lack of support in Congress. And, uh, you know, as soon as the, uh, you know, Southern representatives and senators, which were so graciously returned to Congress after the Civil War, were able to, you know, voice their will and their opinions. Uh, it was, you know, dead in the water, basically. And the Fruit and Board was stripped of almost all of its funding until it was eventually just completely shut down or shut down. And then that's when you got into a lot of the passing of these laws that was described in this video specifically uh, in those states, since they were able to uh, return uh, their uh, individual states' wills to those and enacted the Black Codes, which would then be followed historically by the Jim Crow laws, et cetera, et cetera. And then as Antoine uh, pointed out in the chat, the federal troops, were withdrawn from the South and they left the black people to the will of all those hostile people all around them. And so then followed a very violent period. Uh, if this wasn't already violent, now followed an even more violent period. And uh, let's bring up that hopefully this next slide, this next uh, clip is about that, Adam. The Red Summer of 1919 is a very important moment as it would relate to matters of civil service, really. So in this time period, you have a lot of veterans returning from World War I, or the United States fought on the side of the Triple Entente. And in that regard, you had lots of Black people serving in the American military in this time. Now, the military was still heavily segregated, as was mentioned in the previous section, However, in this sense, you had black soldiers that were putting their lives on the line and fighting in combat against the enemies of the United States of America that are returning to be brutalized and abused by the very same country that they had just devoted their lives to protecting. And so you have lots of examples of black World War I veterans, you know, uh, forming militias to protect Black communities from racist mobs that would go after uh, Black populations during this time frame. So you have lots of examples of uh, Black uh, communities and Black neighborhoods that were formed and were not only self-sufficient, but prospering based on just levels of uh, internal economic interaction and investments of the black people living there. And these places were truly brutalized in horrid acts of terrorism by white people that were uh, just uh, aghast at such displays. And these are situations where you just have law enforcement turning a complete blind eye, or even in some cases assisting in the brutalization and the destruction of uh, Black prosperity or even Black existence in many cases. So to dive a bit into the aspects of uh, American policing, it's a very complex history. 
certainly something that you can draw from in regards to all of the uh, farthest roots of American policing, which is the same with all policing in the world, is that policing is a form of uh, law enforcement and armed law enforcement for the sake of protecting power structures. And when you're dealing with a system that has inherently racist or bigoted aspects that are accepted or in many cases directly key and integral to said power structures, that is often where you can find said roots. So a common connection and link to policing and uh, uh, in, the, in the United States of America, and especially in the Deep South, or uh, direct links to uh, slave patrols, which were, you know, uh, informal groups of law enforcement that were used to return escaped slaves to their uh, plantations should they uh, ever flee from their locations. Other such examples to uh, protecting the uh, pre-existing power structures, one that was common in the uh, Puritan Northeast, were, you know, local, uh, you know, night patrols that would be responsible for uh, monitoring and policing the uh, religious uh, dignity of their neighbors should they step out of line of the uh, the Puritan roots and traditions, you know, branching into things such as uh, suspicions of blasphemy or, pap or uh, papery, as it would have been said at the time, or even branching to things such as witchcraft, which is something that's very commonly known to be associated with the history of the Northeast and uh, the United States. So... You have lots of history of brutalization of Black people in the United States. And this is something that is perpetrated on many levels, both institutionally in regards to uh, codified law. And now in this time period, we're often branching into how uh, a specific level of physical cruelty and brutality is inflicted upon the Black citizenry by the white citizenry. You have examples of entire neighborhoods, let alone individual homes, being burned and looted because they were examples of Black prosperity. You have situations of raw and bloodied beatings against Black individuals by white mobs for uh, simple matters of fraternization or stepping outside of the uh, perceived bounds of what was acceptable at the time. And these are things that continue in certain levels. You have uh, perceptions and stereotypes born from these sorts of things, such as the perceptions of Black men as inherent threats, especially inherent threats to the vulnerable uh, white woman, which had to be protected by the white male citizenry at all costs. And that was a very common uh, inciting incident for a lot of these acts of brutality. That's the movie King Kong. Lynching, of course, being the ultimate example and symbol of this, where you would have uh, this particular symbology. You know, you would take a, uh, a Black individual and you would hang them by the neck until dead. And that's the bare minimum of what the uh, technical definition of lynching is. It was often also associated with horrid and cruel acts of mutilation and uh, embarrassment, you, mas uh, you know, it, it even often emasculating the uh, the uh, subjects in question in a very literal sense, not in the uh, sociological sense. And these are truly horrid and bloody evil acts that were committed as quite literal uh, acts of terrorism in order to cause enough fear and panic in order to lower and keep the, uh, the uh, Black Americans in their place that were deemed for them to uh, subsist in. And so, uh, I mean, there, there is so much that just doing this little flash and having this little discussion doesn't even get us close. So the 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 videos that you receive will give you more um, more in depth. But it, it none of it is is enough. 
I mean, we see in the papers every day now where, you know, Manhattan Beach was taken from the Black, uh, this strip of land was taken from the Black owners of it. And that's how it was. And, and as somebody, maybe it was Jordana brought up in the chat, there, and, and as you can see, looking back through the history, white people were told and taught that they should, if they saw a black person to watch, it wasn't just the slave patrols. If you were white, you had the right to question a black person anywhere you saw them. So now white people still see a black person and, and are ready to question. And we see that. We saw that uh, we- Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin, right. So uh, Farrah, I just wanted to say when you were in your, in the video clip, you talked about this emasculating that goes on. And I always think about New York City with the thousands and thousands of stop and frisks, which mostly affected black men and boys. And if you looked at them, they were pushed up about uh, fences, they're in public. Sometimes they had to pull down their trousers uh, right on the street because they were being frisked. And uh, it just reminds me of this ongoing, and you know, even the things that go on today, like, you know, what, what Diane is saying, just questioning the presence of people at a university or in a neighborhood. Um, and so, it, yeah, it's just continued in a different form. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, yeah. like when, I, when I had mentioned that in the video, I did mean it like in the most literal and brutal way which is, you know, like mutilation, though, obviously, that continues to be said in, you know, the, the sociological context. And it obviously is a less physical act in some of those cases, sometimes still physical, but less physical, but it stems from the same sorts of this depraved uh, intentions of inflicting uh, either physical pain or embarrassment or both in a very specific, you know, way to that aspect of personhood. Right, but I think the trauma, like we never talk, we say, oh, think about if you're a 16 year old boy, there's, they even interviewed a man in his thirties. He was stopped seven, eight times over the years and that happened to him. So it's not a, a physical, well, it, I think it's probably very frightening, but it's, it's not a, a lynching, but it's a humiliation that is a trauma. And if you think about that happening publicly, I mean, to me, it's a huge trauma, and it's affected all of those tens of thousands of men and boys at the, who were boys at the time. Mm -hmm. I can speak on that. <clears throat> as far as looking the way I look, or looking the way the Frank looks, or looking the way the Pharaoh looks, we could probably all tell you a story or two about what I call blue nights. And I call a blue night is a night when you get pulled over by some punk cop who thinks that he's better than you and thinks that you're about wrong or that he can find something on you or that he can intimidate you or that you're gonna do something stupid to give him a reason to shoot you. So one of these particular, and I've had a few, um, and this mind you, I'm a teacher. I'm not a criminal, <laughs> I'm not a hood. You know what I'm saying? I'm a upstanding member of our community, by golly. And so <laughs> when this happens, you know, I'm sitting the last time it was because they were having a, um, they were having a, 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 a what do they call those blocks, a roadblock. I saw the roadblock long before it happened, didn't feel like dealing with it and decided to go a different direction. This guy chased me down, pulls me over. I said, okay. I stopped the car, put my hands on the, on the, the wheel. Many brothers have been getting shot all of my life, so I know better, right? Put them up there. What's the problem? Blah, blah, blah. There's a Negro standing over here, and I said that word on purpose. There's a Negro cop over here, European cop over here. He pulls his gun and puts it to my temple with his finger on the trigger, and he's just trying to intimidate me, this and that. Meanwhile, I'm saying, sir, I'm a teacher. I haven't done anything wrong. What's the problem? Blah, blah, blah. My hands are obviously here. I'm, I'm looking at this Negro to try to give me some help because I'm thinking by looking at you look like me, maybe you'll say something. Maybe you'll do something in that powerful position you have. But you've been manipulated and mind warped as well. And you're probably more my enemy than this jerk is. So I don't want to get all off into it. I'm just saying that, yes, these 
feelings of anger, these feelings of fear, these feelings of um, uh, survivalist tactics, instincts that have to kick in for us to survive here. It's all very real for us. And we just, you know, it's really shouldn't be. We want other people to try to understand where we're at because when you're, when you're looked at and they just look at you and they just come up with all these things and then they, oh, this guy was bird watching. Uh, he's, he's in the neighborhood doing something wrong and then the cops come down and you're in trouble. How do these things happen? Especially in a land that was ours first. And that's where I stand too. I believe that this was our land before anybody came here. And then other people went, brought people from Africa here too to work for them after they destroyed the indigenous people who were here. So there's a theft problem, of, you know, as, as well as brutality and continued economic disparity. So to not go off on too much of a tangent about, you know, this, like modern policing. Right. But um, uh, what was I going to say about modern policing? Goodness. Um, oh, right. So I was just going to say, like, there's certainly nothing in the context of modern policing that incentivizes or, or beyond that, even like uh, allows for there to be any meaningful or realistic interaction or, uh, or um, you know, monitoring of police for each other, you know? Like, police have been fired from their positions is for complaining about actions pertaining to policing, not even in their department, not even in their state on social media, and that's enough to get them fired from their positions. So, like, it, that's enough to, to do that. It certainly is enough to do that in regards to actually trying to do something in a moment. And obviously, doing something in a moment physically could be morally worth it, regardless of if you lose your job. That could be way less important or would always be way less important in my opinion than potentially saving someone's life but that's why so many you know, even if they're a police officer observing something wrong and they aren't directly participating in the action that's wrong that's why they won't do anything about it well thank you um as you all know watching your clocks it's 229 and so uh, we're not going to get a chance to bring up everything, but it has been a, a powerful conversation. This is recorded. We'll be able to see again, look again. And I want to thank everybody from, for coming. And Frank, let me call on Frank to talk about, we've got other things coming up. This is an overview of what we have in plan for the rest of the year. Yeah. So everyone, uh, thank you for coming. Can't do it without the people that show up and support. And we do have other events that we're going to be putting on. And everyone has been out to Eventbrite. That's where you got your tickets from. If you go back out, there will be, and you just search for the Racial Justice Collaborative, you can actually follow us just like uh, Facebook, Instagram, all those other things. You can hit the follow button and you'll receive an email every time that we post an event you'll be the first ones to know about it and get the details. So we do have some coming up. There's one uh, later in the month and then uh, next month. I think this series will run through October. Is that it? Yes, yes. Uh, the, there's um, one that's not yet listed, but soon will be listed. Uh, that's about hip hop, uh, Sundiata. And appropriations again. Because it happens all the time. <laughs> Everything is always about the money. Watch. If the you money. got something good, they'll take it because they want it because they want to benefit from it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we've got that coming up. I believe that's on the 22nd of May. So that's really soon. We're going to look for that on Eventbrite. And then in June, we've got a race retreat where we'll talk. This, over, this today is an overview of the whole thing. And then we've got workshops coming up that pull out the information. So the, the race retreat in June, we're going to, it's more about wealth and it's about the, the, the disparity, the wealth gap, but it's specifically going to talk about redlining because where does middle-class wealth come from? What was, why was it intended? It comes in housing and redlining was it again, like the uh, Social Security Act of 1935, the redlining of the intention of that was to make sure black people did not benefit. Suburbs were built to benefit white people. They put all kind of money into those suburbs. 
black people, they put a, a red line around black communities and said, don't give mortgages, don't let people, don't let companies go in there and buy. So more of that in June, the race retreat. And then after that, we're going to talk specifically about police and mass incarceration. And then after that in August, we've got a justice and equity. Uh, Jordana's leading that up and she's going to bring us together on the wealth that was created for, out of slavery. And, so, and a lot of these companies are still in existence and we're moving up toward reparations. So we need to know about those companies. And then in September, Jai is here, Jordana Lane, they're gonna talk about white people, whiteness, and how do white people, how do white people learn this superiority uh, and, and to centralize whiteness and to normalize whiteness. So we're gonna look at that. And then in October, we've got a new race retreat that will, uh, will bring it all together. This is called the truth campaign. And then the, in October, we're gonna start off on reparations. What is that? What does that mean? Okay, so thank you all very much for coming. And um, anybody else want to say any last word before we? Pharaoh, you have a last word, I'm sure. Uh, my <laughs> last word on this subject would be it's just important to keep thinking about these things. You know, it was one of the first things that we said in the first conversation, which is, you know, this history is grim, but so is most of history. And what's important about it is to study it and learn from it so that we can better ourselves for the future. Because what happened has happened and we need to understand it so that we can know what will happen and make what we want to happen, that present and that reality. And so um, Lily just asked the question, if the full video uh, is on YouTube, we're gonna put, um, we'll put it up on there. And then when we send out uh, as something after this event to thank everybody and to remind, uh, so we can put our acknowledgements up again of the people who helped, helped us with this, we'll send you a link uh, to the video and then you can watch that. And then look at our, uh, our website, racialjusticecollaborative.com and uh, send us some contact information. You should join us. We're all, we're working on this building a movement. So join us. Thank you all. I couldn't do this without Pharaoh. Thank you, Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. This was great. I wanted to say something, Diane, but Pharaoh said it's so lovely that I don't wanna, you know, try to mess anything up, but I did wanna add the last thing for people to try to look into Lincoln. You brought up uh, two cases, the Dred Scott case and Lincoln, right? Well, Lincoln's not a case, but Lincoln was a lawyer, as you know, and there was a case where Lincoln defended this man who was being accused as a slave, and he turned it, He his defense was that the man was a Moor and not a slave because he fit under a different status. So I think we should look at what does being white actually mean, as opposed to the complexion of one's skin, because it's way deeper than that. And I think that's part of our discussion that can move us forward in our next things. Okay, that is Sundiata, uh, May 22nd, Appropriations. <laughs> so look for that on Eventbrite. Thank you. Thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all for coming. Well done, well done, y'all. Thank you. What's up, Mark? What's up, Kathy? What's up, Sundiata, <laughs> Mendingo? What's going on? Farrell, amazing. <laughs> You're brilliant, son. Really? Oh, that's lovely. They were just smiling away. <laughs>